World War I, I'm told, was supposed to be the war that ends all war, right? Um, after World War II, I, there was supposed to be an incredible amount of, I wasn't around back then, just so you all know. There was supposed to be an incredible amount of optimism, though, in the West. Uh, you, you know, evolutionary progress, okay, we got that out of our system. We, we, we realize now we can finally get on to building uh, utopia here on Earth, a world of, of peace and, and progress. Uh, many folk had this mindset. Uh, William Golding, uh, author, also had that perspective until World War II kicked in. And then after World War II and the atrocities of much of what happened came out and the Cold War began, uh, there was an ideological shift among many, uh, William Golding as well, and that's when he wrote his uh, famous Lord of the Flies. I don't know if you've read this or remember this, but a, a plane of... of uh, schoolboys, choir boys, is shot down during war, World War II. Uh, they, they, by a deserted island, they are uh, go to the island. They, all the kids make it. And when you first see them, they're marching down the beach, and they're wearing their choir robes, and they're singing in multiple heart, part harmony. And it's just wonderful. But as they're on this, this island with themselves, they change. They shed their choir robes. They start putting on war paint. They go out on hunts for food and they, they start enjoying the cruelty of killing the animals as they kill the animals. They begin worshiping the beastie. They, they d turn on each other and there begins to be power plays and hate and prejudice and, and uh, they begin to actually kill one another. And what Golding is saying is, is mankind left to himself will do this. This is, is the most sophisticated, the most educated. This is what's in our hearts. We can't get away from it. And, and certainly, Golding wasn't far from wrong. You know, there are 10 major wars going on in this world right now. Major war is any war where they have at least 1,000 casualties per year. On top of that, there are 10 um, significant armed conflicts going on with, with less than 1,000 deaths. There are another 15 armed conflicts that have around 200 or less deaths a year. This is what's going on. This has been going on since Genesis 4, right, with Cain and Abel. Um, gets into the domestic world. Multitude are the victims of uh, domestic abuse, spousal abuse, child abuse. And if we stop and, and think about it, how many of us don't have some sort of uh, relational graveyard in our backyard where friends or family... Just the relationship went south and we were just never able to put it back together. I mean, all of us have that experience. The warringness is in our heart. Now, Daniel knew all about warring. Daniel was taken from his home when he was about 14, 15 years of age. He spent his entire life in Babylon in a government that was uh, known for swallowing up people groups, known for their cruelty in war. Daniel knew all about war. Daniel was then in the Persian government a cabinet that was also known for its cruelty and swallowing up people. He knew all about war. And in the, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, we went through that uh, months ago now, but it was uh, really answering the question, how do you live godly in a pagan place? He's in Babylon, how do you live godly? But then the second 12, or second uh, set, six chapters, chapters 7 through 12, Daniel writes, and it shows us kind of his uh, journal, his private time. And in that, the, that last six chapters, he has four visions. He's got one in chapter 7. We talked about that one. He's got one in chapter 8. He's got one in chapter 9. Then he's got one in chapters 10, 11, and 12. Mike started us down that road last week of chapter 10. But this last vision for Daniel is a, a vision of the war that really will end all wars. It's what we call and what scripture will call in other places the battle of Armageddon. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me chapter 10 of Daniel, even though Mike hit that last week, we're just going to touch on it for just a second. Daniel chapter 10. And if you didn't bring your Bible, oh, you should have brought it today. This would have been a good one. You'd, some of the stuff, glorious, glorious text. I'm really convinced that there's no way in the world I can do it justice. We got a lot of information to go through, so hang on. But if you could see it in your word with the pen going, you'd be able to come back. So I encourage you to do that. Chapter 10, though, of Daniel, verse 1. 
It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that fourth vision, fourth vision comes in his third year. That's 537 B.C. Keep that date kind of etched in your mind, real important. Um, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. Now, not several wars, and we're going to see the vision in a second, and there's several wars going on in there, but those aren't the ones he's talking. There's a final climactic war of all wars, and that's what he's pointing to. Now, before we, we look at the, the vision, you've got to ask yourself this. Why did God give Daniel this vision? Did God just decided, well, I think I'll give this vision to uh, any, any, Daniel's going to get it. Yeah, it wasn't there, was there more to it than that? And there was, verse 12 of chapter 10. Uh, Daniel's talking to this angelic uh, visitor who came to give him the vision. Verse 12, it says, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. The vision is an answer to a prayer. Real important. Because if you want to understand the answer, you, by golly, better understand the question. If you don't know the question, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what the answer means. Daniel has is, is been looking forward to... Uh, the release of the Jewish people for some time. Remember, he, he'd been waiting for it. Jeremiah let him know that in 70 years, the Babylonian captivity would end. And so Daniel's been counting down. He's been, year 539, Cyrus is on the throne, and Cyrus makes an edict. We've got this in the Cyrus Cylinder. It's Cyrus's perspective. He makes an edict that all Israel can go back to, to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. They can all go back. And he says, and I'll flip the bill. And so Daniel's got to be going, yes, finally, we can get out of this God-forsaken place. Let's go. Come on, let's all go. Well, Daniel, you got to keep in mind, is over 90. It's a 900-mile walk. Daniel might be thinking this might be just a bit tad too much for me right now. But still, he's excited. Let's all go. Come on, come on. And Scripture says only a remnant to go. A, a small group, 40,000 people, the vast majority of them stay. And Daniel's got to be going, well, hey, well, maybe you didn't hear me. We can go back. Cyrus said, he'll pay for it. Let's go. And the people are just kind of staring at him. Yeah, well, I know. I'm not so sure. And he said, wait, wait, wait. We can go back and rebuild, rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, you know, where we can sacrifice, where, where Yahweh dwells. We can, we can have our relationship with God put back together. Come on, let's go. And the people are like, eh, well, you know. And they walk away. And Daniel's going, I, I don't understand this. We can go back and rebuild our relationship with God. And they're saying, No. And so his heart's crying out, God, what do you do with this? What, 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 what are your people? What do we do now? And so he gives them this vision, starting in chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is a pretty long chapter. It's got two divisions, really, in it, though, verses 1 through 35 and then 36 through 45. Okay, I'm going to give you a synopsis, really, on that 1 through 35 part. Uh, but fascinating. Just some of the most detailed prophecy in Scripture is found in these 1 through 35 verses. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, and the first part of this vision goes over what's going to happen to Daniel's people, the Jews, next. And so it talks about a succession of Persian kings. And then as the vision goes... It talks about the rise of a, a empire from Greece. Now, you've got to keep in mind, that was going to happen in the 300s. Daniel's writing this in 537. Greece is on the map, but barely on the map. And, but he says there will be, the, the, this Greek empire will take over the Persian empire. And, and the, not only that, but the, the main Greek ruler, who is, who is the man who, who conquers all of y'all, will die at a young age. And then his, his, his empire won't go to one of his heirs, which would be normal. Instead, it's going to be divided up amongst four people. Well, this, you know, believe it or not, this happened. And this was future for Daniel. For us, it's, it's history. In 323 B.C., Alexander the Great 
the leader of the Greek empire who conquered Persia, died at a young age. He was 32 years of age. Immediately, as soon as he died, they killed his two sons, sons who had been heir to the throne. They, they were killed. Then his generals began to fight with each other to see who would take over this, this empire. After a while of fighting, they decided to just divide this empire up into four ways, just like Scripture says. We have the, the map, I think. And this is how they, they, it was divided up, basically. You got the general, Cassander, received uh, you know, Greek proper, uh, Macedonia. Then you got Lysimachus, got a lot of Asia Minor. Uh, Ptolemy received Egypt, and Ptolemy got the Holy Land, really important. And then Seleucus, General Seleucus, is all over here. Now, in time, what was going to happen is Ptolemy's empire was going to be big. Uh, Seleucus's empire was going to be big, Seleucid uh, dynasty. Uh, the other two wouldn't fall off the map per se. Well, one of them would, but that's a long story. But that, they kind of fall out of our picture. But these two end up warring over and over and over again. That's what this first part of the vision is about. The king of the south and the king of the north, they fight. And you know what they're fighting for right here, which is Israel. They keep fighting with each other back and forth, back and forth. And Israel, of course, is like right in that buffer thing, so they're constantly getting clobbered. This, as this vision goes... Uh, it ends with, it names four kings, it lists four kings. The fourth king was from the king from the north. This, the Seleucid Empire ultimately took over Palestine. And that, that king that it mentions, it refers to, is Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Remember, we talked about him several weeks ago. And his hate and his cruelty and his warring heart was, was focused on the people of, of Israel. And he comes through Jerusalem at one point and he wipes out 80,000 little boys and girls and older men and women and moms and dads, just massacres the Jewish people. He goes into their temple, and this is important. There were synagogues, and actually the synagogues just started popping up around the, this time. But the synagogues are a place for Jewish people where you would go and learn the Torah. Uh, you can't sacrifice there. There's one temple. You go to the temple, and that's where you sacrifice, and that's where your atonement is, is made, and that's where you connect with God at the temple. Well, uh, Antiochus goes into the temple, and he sets up a statue of Zeus, and he sacrifices swine on, on the altar. And any Jewish person who he hasn't killed, he brings before Zeus, and he says, okay, you need to worship Zeus. And if they don't, he kills them there. His goal is to, to wipe out the Jewish people and, and, and cause them all to be, in their thinking anyway, in their heart and their value system, Greeks, that's, that's the goal. That's what they're supposed to do. And then this first vision in chapter 11, the first part of the vision ends. In verse 36, if you have your own Bible, if you look in your own Bible, you probably have a division right there. There's probably a little sub, subheading. There's, there's a division between 35 and 36. And you say, well, well why? Uh, because if you keep going to the story, it sounds like the same story, kind of. Most Bible scholars including the authors of the NIV Study Bible and the ESV Study Bible, say, oh, no, 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 something different is going on here. In these first 35 verses, there are 135 detailed, specific prophecies that when Daniel wrote them, they were yet future. But because where we're at in history, we can corroborate with, with history and look at these 135 prophecies and see that all 135 of them were fulfilled specifically, exactly as Daniel said. But suddenly, verse 36 on, there's not a whole lot of history on that. People think that, that verse 36, it talks about the king. Well, this has got to be Antiochus, of course, because they've just been talking about him. But the details about him are nothing like we know about Antiochus. Also, earlier it says that Antiochus is the king of the north. But here, he's going to be distinguished from the king of the north. Also, in verse 35, which acts as a transition verse, it says, I don't think I've got a screen on this one, but it says that... Uh, this will be till the time of the end. Now that phrase, time of the end, is a, not just words thrown together, that is a theological phrase that is used over and over again in scripture that almost always refers to the final end. This is, all this is going on, but then the final end. Let's talk about that. So verse 36, you have the king will do as he pleases. The willful king, we call that. Now, 
probably a perk of kings to kind of do what you want to do, right? Is, uh, I'm in charge. I can do what I want to do. I'm the king. But, but this term refers to no limitations. And every king has limitations. There are bordering countries and bordering armies. Antiochus had a very tight noose around his neck that the Romans put on. They would not let him move beyond the parameters of his own little, little fiefdom. But the thought is here is this king has no limitations. This king goes wherever he wants in the world. This king is probably spoken of in Daniel, first vision of Daniel 7, second vision of Daniel, Daniel 8, third vision of Daniel, Daniel 9. The, the one key thread in all of the visions of Daniel, same thing, this person. This person is called the, the, the little horn in Daniel 7. He's referred to in 2 Thessalonians, written after Antiochus, of course, by Paul as the man of lawlessness, or the son of perdition. He's referred to in Revelation 13 as the beast. He's referred to in 1 John 2 as the Antichrist. He's a leader who will, who will arise, who is kind of like Jesus was, was God incarnate. This guy will be Satan incarnate. And as Jesus was for righteousness, this guy will be just on the other side of, of, of the spectrum. He says that he will exalt and magnify himself above every God and will say unheard of things against the God of gods. Now, uh, when Paul's writing about this in 2 Thessalonians, this very guy, we have it on the screen, he says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Also, when you look at 1236 uh, or 1136, it says that he says unheard of things against the God of, of gods. He, he, he blasphemes. Revelation lets us know that this was uh, going to be the story of the, the beast as well. Next text. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was a, a blasphemer as, as well. If you go through in verse uh, 37, it says, He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers. That's, and we know Antiochus did. He put a statue of Zeus in the temple. He was all about worshiping the, the Greek gods. He was trying to make the, the Jews worship the Greek gods. But this person's going to be an atheist of sorts. He has no desire for one, he has no concern for the one desired by women, which would either be the Messiah or perhaps normal family relations. No, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. Then what transpires, if you go down into verse 40, I don't have this on the screen, so just listen, okay? This is getting up to Armageddon. This is this final Antichrist king. At the time of the end, there we have it again, verse 40, the king of the south will engage him in battle. And the king of the north, see, differentiated from the king of the north, the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships, no doubt modern-day equivalents. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. It's Palestine. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. That's the south. He will gain control of the treasures of the gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt and the Libyans and the Nubians in submission. But reports from the east and the north. Now, this is cryptic. I got that, but let's, let's focus for a second. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. And he will set out in great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. If you take the other texts in scripture that talk about this final war, and this is not an isolated thing. Joel chapter 2, huge. Ezekiel 38 and 39 You've got uh, Zechariah 12 through 14 talk about, talks about this final time. Revelation 16 talks about this final time. And putting that together, let me give you just a synopsis. What happens, it seems, 
is even in this, this Antichrist world empire, uh, there's disunity, there's division. How could hell be otherwise, right? And, and so there's a coup that begins to, to, to fester. You've got a superpower from the, the south or the Arab bloc. And it says that he's going to gain the air block's treasure, which I don't know. It's oil? I don't, I don't know. But they, they're coming up from the south, from the, from the north, uh, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Ezekiel names the geographical regions. He calls them Gog, Magog, Tubal, Meshach. These are geographical regions that are today located in, up in the area of, of Russia. And so the, 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 the north is coming down. Also, Ezekiel lets us know that there's an empire from the east coming in. And so all of these, these superpowers of the world are converging to try to take this guy out. And as they come, they all find their way. They all kind of converge in a place called Megiddo, the Valley of Armageddon. And initially, their desire is to, to wipe out the Antichrist. He does a job number on them, of course. And then according to Revelation 19, Jesus comes back. Whole new sermon series, okay? We're not going on there. But Jesus comes back, and it's not much of a battle, in all honesty. That's why it says, it doesn't give you a whole lot of detail, just he lost. Yeah, it's not much of a battle when Jesus comes back. Uh, he, he's done. But then chapter 12, and when you get, if you got your pen and it's your Bible, you go ahead and cross out that 12 because we know chapter divisions weren't added to like 1300, and this is just a bad one because the story just keeps rolling. It says, at that time, what time? Well, the time the Antichrist is, is, is on the scene, the time that he is really um, uh, engaged. Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. We saw Michael earlier in chapter 10. Um, Michael is the scripture called the archangel. He's in charge of all the angels. He's the only one who has that title. There is thought that at one point somebody else had that title. That was Lucifer, who was the chief of the angels. But when he lost his position, Michael was kind of promoted. I don't know how the angelic uh, org chart works, but Michael was, was, was promoted. And he's in charge. And when it says that um, Michael rises, that means he stands up. That means that he is, he's getting involved. And the reason why he has to get involved is because, again, this Antichrist is, is none other than Satan. And so he has to get involved. We see in, in Revelation where this actually is happening here we see a very important thing. Revelation chapter 12 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, Michael arose, fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now this is not that initial thing when Lucifer fell and he was kind of booted from heaven. Think about Job 1. One in Job 2, okay, where, where God's up in, in heaven and Satan appears before him. Remember to kind of, kind of try to rat Job out? Remember this story? Satan's there. Well, somehow he has access. And I don't know. He doesn't give us all the details. He's trying to start a coup here at this point. But Michael and the angels arise, kick him out. And it seems from Revelation, from that point on, it all... Hell breaks loose on the, the, the people of God. Satan takes his uh, uh, anger, his vengeance, his hate against God and brings it on God's, God's people. Uh, Michael uh, says there will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then distress. Jeremiah is going to call this a time of Jacob's trouble. Zechariah 13 talks about this. This time of distress is what most of Revelation is about when we think of Revelation. Chapter 6 to 19 talks about this time of distress. Jesus prophesies about this in Matthew 24 verses 15 and 21. Jesus says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning beginnings of the world until now and never to be equaled again now back in Daniel 7 it lets us know what happens when this uh, antichrist person shows up he signs a treaty with with Israel for for seven years pact uh, allegiance whatever for seven years and the first three and a half are fine but then this last three and a half this is the time of great distress and, and if you were to take all the passages Revelation specifically on this one 
you would learn that what goes on during this time of distress, well, it's war continuously, famine. There are uh, one-third of the earth is destroyed, one-third of the seas are destroyed, one-third of the heavenly bodies, something transpires with them. Um, you have all the fresh water in earth ultimately being uh, polluted. You have uh, uh, plague and, and sores on people. You have demons unleashed on people. This will be a time of great persecution. During this time, two-thirds of the people in the nation of Israel will be destroyed. They will be, will be, be killed. And you have to ask yourself, what is going on? Why? Why? Now, back up a second. I think you take God out of the picture, okay, just throw up God and his sovereignty and the rest of it, and you just leave us to ourselves. This kind of whole thing would be this much or worse by now anyway. And so um, you, you ask yourself why. God, it's what God uses often to bring us back. I think when Moses is perhaps prophesying even here in Deuteronomy 4, when Moses says, when you are in distress and these things have happened to you, bad stuff, then in the latter days... You will return to the Lord, your God, and obey him. Remember what's big on Daniel's heart is, God, my people, they, they, they're blowing you off. What do we do now? I mean, if, if all of Babylon doesn't turn around, what do we do? Trouble often. Zechariah chapter 12. This is a great verse because this is talking about this exact time. It says, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me. This is God talking. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. When have people pierced God? And this is written 400 years before Jesus. Fascinating. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And they will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. He's talking about Christ. Uh, the, the crying, the tears are tears of repentance, are tears of, of, of sorrow, godly sorrow. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping in Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo, the valley of Armageddon. Or it will be as, or it will be the same thing as. It's this end stuff that God is going to use to bring back the nation. Apostle Paul is talking about this. In, in Romans 11, his heart is beating exactly, in Romans 9, 10, and 11, his heart is beating exactly like Daniel's. And he's, he's wondering, what will happen to the, to the Jewish people? They've blown God off. They don't care about him anymore. They quit. And so he says, I, I'd trade my salvation for theirs if I could make it work. Just any parent would do that for their child. And Paul is, is thinking that. He's thinking the same thing Daniel's thinking. What are we going to do for Israel? And here, he says that, that uh, in time, at the end, all Israel will be saved. There'll be a time when they come back as a nation. The nation who rejected him will come back as a nation. They will, they will be saved. Paul recognizes that the great distress, the great tribulation, its goal, at least one of its goals, is to bring Israel back to get them to a place where their heart is finally broken, where, where their, their stubbornness is, is, is done. And I don't say they have stubbornness and we don't, so please don't go down that road with me. Um, but uh, the goal of that, and you know as well as I do, sometimes it's through the pain that you and I decide to take a hard look at reality and where I'm at and what's going on, and, and God's going to do the same thing here. And then, verse 2. You know, when I was a kid in Chicago, I didn't grow up in the, in the I wasn't in the ghetto, but I wasn't in lower middle class neighborhoods, probably where we were at, or, or a little bit less. One of the things we did in the summertime, because none of us had air conditioning, is uh, actually the older kids did this. I never did this, just so you know. They would go to the fire hydrant, and they would take off the top, and then they, I don't know if they used a hacksaw or what, but they'd cut off like a third of it, screw it back on so that the hole was at the top, and then they'd get a tire iron and just open that thing up. The fire hydrant would, would come out, hit that hole, and poof, just spray. And every kid in the neighborhood is just in the middle of the street. We were just being drenched. It was glorious. Nothing, nothing was better than this. It was just wonderful. What happens is when everything is bad, right? I mean, it is, it is really bad. It's not getting a whole lot better. Here, the, the, the vision shifts, and, and God pours blessing and hope on Daniel, so much that Daniel can't even handle it. In chapter 2, it, it starts. He says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Listen, you, all, you and I, in our New Testament theology, might understand the, the, the idea of resurrection. This was not that big of a thing in the Old Testament. This was sketchy at best. 
And, and you're not going to find a clearer text in the Old Testament that talks about resurrection. This, this idea of sleep is, is a metaphor. These guys have been dead and buried. And it says they will awake. They will rise. Some will, will, will to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. There's a resurrection. It doesn't just, it's just not all over. When I die, I'm all done. It's all finished. It's done. And God says, no, that's not the way it works. Um, verse 3. This is just two has got to be blowing his mind. But verse 3 says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and, and, and ever. In scripture, at least from Proverbs on, the wise are those who realize that this is the word of God, that realize that I've got a, a creator. My life is to be lived for him. I am submission to him. I'm not, my, I'm not my own boss. I'm not in charge. He is, and therefore I live every element of my life in light of him. That's what scripture says is the wise person. At this point, the wise person is going to shine. And don't you love it? He equates the wise person with one who leads many to righteousness. I think this reward system that they're talking about is what crowns may be. It's what uh, uh, our rewards that we'll receive at the, at the Bema seat, what they are. And let me just take a break for a second because up to this point, the judgment has been corporate, corporate solidarity. The, 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 the repentance has been corporate. But here the rewards are individualistic, real important. Let me just tangent for a second. If you, your heart beats with God's, and if you are committed to, to influencing people, what does it say? It lead many to righteousness. That's your heart. You, you pray for that. You try. You truly try. You want to see people come to know Christ. And so you, you, you try. You don't want to be offensive. Don't be obnoxious. But you know that if this is true, this is a huge issue. And so that's where your heart is. And you're trying. Let me let you know something. You will have an incredible reward one day. You might say, well, I, I didn't see many come to know him, but I've tried. It's not your job. It's not my job to, to, to make people come to know Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's job. It's your job and mine to testify. And those who are doing such, their heart is beating with his. And somehow, I don't know if it's a reflection of the Shekinah glory of God. There's a brightness. There's, but it's, it will probably be pretty good, the re reward that will be there one day. So, so Daniel, even though this is way in the future, you just need to know. Daniel, there's a, there's a reward day out there. But you, Daniel, close up this and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. It's not talking about making this secret. It's just saying preserve it because one day, Daniel, the end will come. There will be people, my people, who will live through this. And while they're through this, they're going to be looking for knowledge. They're going to need to know what this is about, and they're going to come check this out one day, Daniel. So preserve it. Verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on the bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. The two others would be uh, angels, we assume. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the water of the river. It's a third person clothed in linen above the water of the river. How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Now notice the angels don't know the answer here. The angels are asking, when will this be done? Does that remind you of a text in the New Testament, maybe? When the apostles come to Jesus and say, when will these end time things be? And Jesus says, the angels of heaven don't even know the answer to that question. And the Son of, of Man, God, Jesus, in his kinetic state, uh, in his incarnate state, doesn't know the answer to that question. But here, whoever this person is, and I'm going to say this is Jesus, linen is the sign of a priest. He's a great high priest. He's going to demonstrate a knowledge that the angels don't even know. Verse 7, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. Psalm 29 lets us know that God resides above the, the waters. Lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever saying, he's, he's, he's pretty confident about his information here. It will be for a time, times, and half a time. Uh, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken... Stubborn hearts have been finally broken, and all these things will be completed. The time, times, and a half of times. It's three, three and a half years. Time is one, times two, and a half times. Three and a half years. In uh, Revelation chapter 
Oh, my goodness. Chapter 12. I believe it's verse 6. He says that it will be for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. In Revelation 13, 5, he says it's believed for 1,260 days, Jewish calendar, it'll be three and a half years. Revelation 13, 5, he says it'll be for 42 months, which is three and a half years. In Revelation 14, 12, he says it will be for time, times, and a half a time, which is three and a half years. It's three and a half years from the time this, is, this, this, this distress breaks out to the time it is fulfilled. The time it is it's fulfilled. Verse 8, he says, I heard... Daniel's talking, says, I heard, but I didn't understand. So I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome? What will the outcome be of all of this? How's this going to go? Get me a little slack, Lord. You're flooring me here. I'm hearing all kinds of stuff right now. I'm trying to get my head around it. Can you go through that again? Can we be a little clearer this time? You got some cryptic stuff you're saying here, uh, Lord. You know, studying the end times does that, doesn't it? Have you done any major studies in the end times stuff? Sometimes when you, when you, often, always, when you get done with it, you have more questions than when you started. And a key question is when? And you do, you do the same question the angels had and the apostles had in the New Testament. When is this going to be? You do, it's just confusing sometimes. Daniel heard this. I mean, you're in good category, good camp, because Daniel said, I don't understand. And he just got it from Jesus. I don't understand. Daniel probably had his hand up on us as far as knowledge goes because he was close proximity. But we have more knowledge than Daniel in the fact that Daniel did not have Joel 2 to compare this to, or Ezekiel 38 and 39, or the Romans 9, 10, and 11, or Matthew 24, 25, or the whole book of Revelation, or Zechariah 12 through 14. Daniel didn't have those, and we do. So we can have more knowledge than Daniel, but we still got to be honest with ourselves and say prophecy at best is a uh, rough sketch. It's not a photograph. Prophecy at best is in the shadows. It's not in, in, the, in, the, in the sun. And it can be confusing. And Daniel says, I'm confused. I don't understand. And I love Jesus' answer. Jesus replies, verse 9, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. In other words, no, I'm not giving you any more answers. No, sorry, you've got enough. I've shared everything with you that you need to know. You're just looking maybe for me to solve curiosity. I'm not doing that. You, you got enough. Just live in light of what you... Leave the future to me. Do you trust me? You got a lot of questions, but do you trust me? I'll, I'll take care of it, Daniel. That's great counsel for Daniel. That's great counsel for us. It's okay to not have all the answers. End time stuff, God makes sure that we're not going to have all the answers. He does say, though, I want to I address your prayer a little bit, though. Prayer for your people. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise, we mentioned that earlier, will understand. You know what I really like about this verse? So it says, it doesn't say many who are purified and spotless and refined. Nah, positionally in Christ we are, but practically you know as well as I do that we are not. I've got all kinds of stains, and I don't like them, and I hate them, and i got besetting sins, and I wish I didn't, and I try, and I fight against, but it's frustrating. But Jesus says, Daniel's looking at his people, saying these guys are sinners. And God says, yeah, yeah, yeah. In time, those who truly know me, I'm going to purify. I will make spotless your, myself. One day, our battle with sin is going to purify. Pragmatically, we're going to be as righteous as we are positionally. And those who aren't interested, they will continue on and not be not interested as well. Verse 11, he says, From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. And you say, whoa, Hank, uh, too much, too much information. Listen, I'm just getting my arms around this, this 1,260 days, this three and a half years. I'm just kind of, what's, what's this extra month, 1,290 days? And then what's this extra 45 days on top of that? You know, it's 1,335 days. Well, I think Jesus would say, no, I'm not giving you any more information. You got all you need to know that there'll be a day when people, my people who are actually in this, check out these, they'll understand. They'll understand. But you don't, you don't, you don't need to know the answers to that. And then he gives Daniel, and this is the greatest, this is so cool. Because the very last verse of the whole book, Jesus is talking. He's giving Daniel 
counsel for basically summation of this entire book, especially its last, last six chapters, how to live this out. He says, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, then at the end of your days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. He says, go your way. He says, Daniel, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, to go through all the stuff that I, that I said. No, don't go through the pieces you don't understand. There's plenty of those. I got it. But what do you understand? You understand that, that from this day on, you just need to know that the world is not going to be a friend to your faith. You're just, you're just gonna, if you want to please them, you just need to know you're not going to make it. You need to, you need to, to realize that, that the uh, culture, the society, that not just at the end of times, but all the way through, there'll be those who rise up against your righteousness, trying to take you out spiritually. It's going to happen. But you need to know in that midst that I'm still in control. I'm still sovereign. You need to trust me with the future. So go your way, Daniel. Live your life based on what you know, what I've shared with you, what you do understand. And he says, you will rest. He said, you're going to die. Don't be afraid of death. And for those in Scripture, those holy saints, they never were. It was a, rest was a good word because they were wrestling with sin. They were wrestling with concern for other, other people. They wanted them to come to know him. It was a wrestling match continually, it seemed. And he says, there'll be a day, you know what, when you rest, when your fighting's done, when your fighting's done, and, and you die. But then, at the end, you will rise. Just as surely as you're going to die, you will rise. Do you believe that? To receive your allotted inheritance, and you will receive your reward. And if I could add to this, based on the rest of scripture that refers to this and your reward oh baby it's going to be better than anything you can imagine that's not bad counsel for Daniel that's not bad counsel for us live, live our life not based on what we don't know and it's not to say we, couldn't, we shouldn't study and try to find out but based on what we do know completely for him not afraid of that time when he calls us home to not live a life in such a way that when he does call us home, we're really nervous because we know we haven't lived up to it. It's, not, it's a time to, to rest. Knowing what the hope of the resurrection brings and that we will have a, a reward one day, certainly. You might not have it in this life, but you we won't have it in this life, but you will have it one day. If you live your life like that, Daniel, you're living out the book of Daniel. There's a story. A little boy woke up with a nightmare one time. Started screaming, Daddy, 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 Daddy. Parents, we've all been there. Dad kind of stumbles in his room, doesn't turn on the lights, but stumbles in. What, 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 what? And the boy, Daddy, Daddy, are, are you there? Dad says, yes, yes, I'm here. He says, Daddy, are you sure that's you? He says, yes, 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 son, it's me, it's me. Daddy, is, is your face looking at me, Daddy? He says, yes, my face is looking at you, and it's closer than you can imagine. And the little boy took a sigh and kind of rolled over and went back to sleep. As we live in this world of darkness, to know that our Father is there. We can't see him, but his face is looking at us. It's closer than we, we can imagine. He's, he's got it down. The future, he's got this. Would you, would you pray with me?